Today's waterfront is a very different place than it was 40, 50, 60, or even 70 years ago. You did everything with your hands and your back. Mostly it was uh, picking it up piece by piece, putting it on a uh, pallet board, and then hoisting it aboard ship. You might have had 200 men working on the ship. And then, of course, a big dock force to um, take the cargo away from the hook or to the hook, as the case may be. The safety factors were very intense. The, from the time the ship docked, uh, there was, there was, you were, had to be about the business of protecting yourself and your partner and, and the other people around you. My first encounter with a tarantula, and it was about the size of a half dollar and kind of ugly and fuzzy, and I was working a banana boat. We unloaded bananas, uh, stalks of bananas by hand. Uh, and again, everything had to be handled specifically by hand. This one spider got inside my shirt. And of course, my body heat warmed him up right away and he was crawling around and making all sorts of uh, feelings that I, I was sure it was a spider, but I was just scared to reach in there and find it because I thought, oh boy, what do I do then? And of course, the ships were in port for a long time. Oh, I'd say, um, minimum seven days in port for, say, a C3 vessel. And uh, now we turn the ships, container ships, in a matter of hours. And uh, in those days, the wages were 95 cents an hour. And, you know, a 16, 17-year-old kid with 95 cents an hour in his pocket was, in the, the day and that age, rich, you know. In 1960, a remarkable partnership was forged between the PMA and the ILWU, paving the way for modernization and containerization. A partnership that would change the face and texture, not only of the waterfront, but also of how the entire world trades. Nobody dreamed in those days that here you'd have ships that are three football fields long, haul upwards to 1,900 uh, containers, and they completely offload them and load it back in 19 hours. The procedure was so organized that they could take, bring, take one container in and bring, bring another out, in and out, and never empty a hook. Uh, that blew my mind. I don't think anyone in their wildest dreams could see what was going to happen ultimately. Hell, the idea of putting boxes and uh, you know putting cargo in big steel boxes, you know I thought that idea would never catch on, but that just shows you how naive I was in 1960. This partnership brought better and cheaper goods to the consumer faster than ever before imaginable. A radio delivered in a container from Japan on Monday could very well be on the shelves of the local Walmart or Target by Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm very aware that. We're all part of this global supply chain. I was fortunate enough to be crane trained, and now I have this job here at APL, and uh, it's uh, the best job in the world, as far as I'm concerned. I'm just the guy who picks up the box off the ship and lands it on a truck, and I'm just the one little spoke in that big cog that goes around. That container full of motors, if it doesn't get there, right when those cars come off the assembly line, you know, then, then there's a big problem. So, right, we are a very important part in that whole supply chain. But this groundbreaking partnership and agreement did not happen by accident or come easily for any of the parties involved. Our generation benefits from the work and wisdom of those who came before. Uh, and we would get many times questions of safety, questions of size of loads. Uh, and what was happening is that the guys in the dock were doing it themselves. They were using job action to get rid of what they considered to be excessive loads, what they considered to be problems with reference to safety. We killed about 13 men in one year, had killed on the waterfront. And men used to fall through the hatches, beams unlocked, you pick a load of cargo up and 
and they'd hit the beam and the beam would come up. Um, I think the average longshoreman really didn't trust, you know, the employer, you know, really didn't trust the Pacific Maritime Association. I'm not quite sure whether the Pacific Maritime Association really trusted, you know, the ILWU. But what concerned the employers more at that time uh, were the abuses of the workforce. And I'm not picking on the ILWU, and I'm just as critical of the employers as I am of the unions at that time. But they had a practice, one of the practices was called four on and four off. You get paid for eight hours, and as we say in Hawaii, aloha for four hours. But I think the idea on the part of the average longshore person was that if we're not careful, that uh, you know, we're not going to have our jobs because our jobs will be taken away from us. Our jobs will be given to somebody else. There was always a constant um, demand from the employers to use fewer men to do the work. And there were always new uh, methods being introduced to require fewer men. and. Uh, and each time there was a shortage of men, we felt that the next person I needed might be me. They were ho hoisting a load out of the hatch when all of a sudden the slings busted loose and the load went down in the hatch to the lower hole and that tin plate was scattering all over and one, one of the workers' heads was taken right off in the square of the hatch and I'm looking down at it and I, it was hard to believe. Ships were being loaded, unloaded, the, just the way they were doing it in Egypt back in the, during the period of the pyramids. But now they've started to move in and they've had pallets and they had this and they had that. Uh, and each one of those moves resulted in either a problem of safety so far as the longshoremen were concerned, or it involved a matter of onerousness. That's the word we use in the longshore for speed up, is, is it onerous? The agreement was forged with the work and sweat of many people from both management and labor. But two leaders proved to be visionaries, working with mutual respect and trust. We, we had great leaders in Paul St. Truer and Harry Bridges. I mean, this would never have come, out, come about without those two fellows, they were wonderful. So I knew Paul very well. He was an extremely intelligent man, uh, and he knew collective bargaining, and he knew workers, and he knew employers. Both were uh, impeccably honest. You know, Harry was a guy that, if you had his word, uh, that was it. He really didn't need anything in writing. But he also represented his union. He never gave anything away that was important for the union. I don't consider them gladiators. I consider them two men with reason. They, they both were looking after their constituents, their principals, and uh, they, had a, they had that responsibility. But uh, transcending that uh, were two men who recognized the, the priesthood of their being. And uh, I think out of that kind of uh, spirituality, something developed that we all benefited. And Bridges then took the position to, with his membership, look, we have two ways to go. We can either fight the machine or try to get a piece of it. And he didn't have an easy way with his own membership. And there were times, for example, when uh, the arguments at the union meetings would get heated and Harry would kind of throw up his hands and say, well, guys, I'm going back to Frisco. Come back and talk to you a little bit later. Um, or there were times at meetings, for example, when he couldn't speak, and then he would start to speak in his, um, you know, very low but but uh, strong voice, for example, and all of a sudden the membership would be rather quiet. They'd listen, uh, and in a sense, he would have convinced them. His ideas now became the ideas of the rank and file. It was an old theater, so there was a stage, and a negotiating group would meet up on the stage and. We'd take turns facing the audience, and there were several hundred longshoremen in the audience. And so if Harry wanted a caucus, we'd be excused. And we'd have to walk through the theater 
through all these guys calling us some very nice names. <laughs> I told Harry to ask Mr. St. Uh what's your opinion? We agreed on this, that there'd be lifetime pensions, lifetime health and welfare care for the pensioners and the, and the working people and their families. And Mr. St. Sure looked across the table and he says, we have an agreement, Harry. What are we arguing about? And of course, uh, Bridges was the master of the theater. You know, he'd just slam his hand down and say, well, that's it. There's no use talking. Storm out and all the guys in the audience clapping him. Then he'd call Paul later and say, when are we going to meet again? <laughs> but those two men, each one dealing with their own people, each one realizing, one realizing it's going to happen whether you like it or not, and the other one's realizing that, hey, we got to share whatever profits come about it. Those are the two things. I, I've often told the employers here and the union here that there ought to be a statue out in front of the PMA building, one of Bridges and one of St. Sure. The Modernization and Mechanization Agreement of 1960 fueled a spectacular growth on the docks and resulted in job security and a guaranteed wage for the rank and file of the ILWU. The essence of it was that the employers would be able to work efficiently and at no time create an onerous workload on the individual longshoremen. And the most important part of that M M contract was the understanding that when any new technology was introduced, you know, we would do it together. That's exceedingly important. In fact, without that understanding, without that trust, that contract would have never worked. For the next 40 years, there was spectacular growth of port tonnage and productivity. The face of the waterfront was changing rapidly. Now all of a sudden, all that cargo has arrived in cute little containers that are nice and clean. You don't see any of these uh, individual pieces anymore. You hook them up to a specialized crane that plops it on the ship. Here's another empty container. Fill that up, put it on the ship, and boom, the ship's gone. Just from the dock to the ship, you're handling 60 tons in one lift, and and uh, in break bulk days, if you handled 100 tons a day for a good gang, a good gang had, had done well. But then it grew so, bad, so fast, I would say within 12 to 15 months, uh, you've seen a flow of container ships in the harbor that we had to hire more men, put more men on the payroll, and, and uh, we put on about 500 men there in about one year. Trade just began to explode. Um, and then, of course, on the longshore side, you know, we looked around and we were always fearful that jobs were going to be lost. But instead of jobs being lost, in fact, jobs began to increase because the sheer volume of the cargo that was coming in now. Seeing containerization just explode, this, this huge terminal right here that's APL, when I first started, American President Line's terminal was a little tiny place over there where the cruise terminal is right now. We're living much longer than we lived in the old days. We we'll have better life. Uh, the quality of life is better for those who, who choose to accept their quality of life. Uh, I, I, things are much better now. There's no question about it. That was our past, our legacy, something we can look to with pride. All of us must now confront the reality of the challenges of the future. Forty years after the ratification of the m and agreement, together we must face the second wave of mechanization on the introduction of information technology. So I don't know what's going to happen in the industry now with all, all the things, uh, the computer availability and other high level, they can shoot people up to the moon, I don't know, maybe they could shoot cargo over the ocean instead of putting it on vessels. I really don't know what the future is. We know we can't stand in the way of progress. Progress is. It's, it's going to come. We can't stop it. All we want to do is make sure that we preserve our place here. And, and as the employer progresses and modernizes and mechanizes, we just want to make sure that we go along with it. And so far, we've done a pretty good job of that, I think. And what I'm hoping is that as we begin to look into the future, that we look back and we look at the M&M contract, because there are guidelines there that say 
certain things that will help us, uh, you know, to move into the 21st century uh, so that we can bring you know, more people in the transportation chain together and to try to solve the problems that we all will face in the 21st century. The texture of the challenges we must confront differs from 40 years ago. There are other members of the global supply chain who must also have their needs met. Well, since 1990, the port has grown about 150%, which is a huge amount of growth for any organism to manage. Um, and it, of course, has meant lower prices for the people in, in the United States, has meant jobs for the region here. But the volume itself brings with it some problems. Uh, we can't isolate ourselves from the community. If anything, we've got to be a force in that community that that offers guidance. One of the problems is we've grown so fast here on our side of the fence that the infrastructure outside hasn't kept up. It means that everybody's going to have to sit down and figure out how everybody is going to be able to work together to improve the overall efficiency of the port complex in Southern California. And everybody includes the ILWU, the ports, the, port, uh, the ports themselves, the steamship lines, the freight forwarders, the custom house brokers, the truckers, and the surrounding communities. You know, we've gotten so fast here, but outside the gate hasn't kept up. You know, all these trucks that we can get in and out of here so fast, they all end up on the same 710 freeway. That's the same three-lane pothole-filled freeway. That's why this Alameda Corridor project is so important. There is a real danger that the, that the price for this growth will be too high for the surrounding communities to bear. There is a real danger that the commuter who was stuck on the 710 freeway every morning as the speeds drop to 17 miles per hour when truck traffic hits 40,000 trucks per day. When people are trying to get to work and it's taking them an hour and a half, two hours to get to Los Angeles, there will be a real fight between the commuter and the trucker for who is going to be on the freeway during the daytime. So it, it behooves everybody in the, in the industry to grapple with these issues before we do indeed choke on our own success. The past is prologue. What will the legacy of today's M&M partners be 20 or 40 years in the future? By embracing the past and applying its lessons to the challenges of the new century, we can pass on a legacy not only to the ILWU or the PMA, but to the entire global community. As I, I think fairly objectively, read the bridge's record and look at the bridge's proposals, many of them have the quality of statesmanship. Paul St. Sure, 1957. The reluctance to change, the fear of the machine, job security, and fear of no jobs. Well, give us time. And working hard, we will eliminate the fear of our workers. These are the number one issues in the eyes of this country today but no union has half as good an answer as we have here in this matter of replacement of men by machines. Harry Bridges, October 18th, 1960. It's still the most inexpensive way to move cargo. And, and the ships are sailing, and we'll load them. We'll load them. I'm not negative about that. I'm not morbid at all about it. There'll be longshoremen. There'll be union leaders. There'll be employers. There'd be a future in this industry. Yes. <laughs>